Holmes, Sherlock and Mycroft. This is a two player only game set in the world of Sherlock Holmes where the two Holmes brothers, Sherlock and Mycroft are competing to solve a case. The case is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Uh, the rulebook explains what is the case that they're both trying to solve and the winner of the game is the player that solves it better, that is that collects the most clues. But at the end this is a worker placement and set collection game where the mystery is simply a pretext. In fact, at the end of the day you will never know whether the person that they are investigating about is guilty or not. It's not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter and as such we don't need to talk about it too much. But for the fact that we need to acknowledge that uh, the game uh, is thematic when it comes to uh, many of the elements, but not overall when it comes to representing a mystery, it doesn't. The rule book is very short, and most of the rule, rules really are about unique effects that the characters can bring into play. As for the main rules, you have four pages, so super short. The game is played on that small board there, uh, or I should say that is where you organize the cards, representing the characters that the players can consult during the game. There are three characters that are always available, Watson, uh, Poor, Miss Hudson and Inspector Lestrade. And then you have slots on the board where other characters will arrive and there is a deck there of characters that will be added to the board each day. The game is divided in seven turns, each representing a day of investigation. During setup you take two cards from the stack here and you put them there. In this case we have Toby and Violet Hunter. Other characters include uh, Von Cram, Billy, Wiggins, uh, we have Ryan Adler, Langman Pyle and Inspector Gregson. And not all of them will come into play in each game. So that is good because you cannot, cal you cannot do too many calculations. You cannot count on one of them to be there. You have your cherry strategy that you want to use every time. Well, you won't be able to because the character that your cherry strategy um, revolves around may not be there. Then we have a deck of clue cards. These are the cards that the players are trying to collect. Each player also has three action pawns, so the workers in our little worker placement game, blue and orange. And that, well, how the game works. At the beginning of each turn, new character is revealed from that from that deck and put into a new slot, with the exception of day one. You do that during during setup, and then players will place their action points on characters on that board and resolve the effect that the character allows them to to benefit from. For example, now actually I should have mentioned also this, the magnifying glasses are the currency in the game that you use, that you spend to purchase clues. There are other ways of getting them, but this is a basic one. So for example, if I go here with my character, I see Mrs. Hudson and I get three magnifying glasses and I add them to my pool and I can spend them later. Now, when you use a character, you put it laying down to represent the fact that the character is tired now. And then my opponent does the same, chooses one of the action points. Suppose that my opponent goes to Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson takes a magnifying glass that you pay to the bank and you in return get a get a clue for from the line of available ones. We'll talk about those later. And Lestrade gives you two cards, but you have to pay three magnifying glasses. So at the beginning of a turn, starting from the second turn, you will simply get up the people that are on the boards and that they were laying down and you have to move them to another location. This is very important. You have to move them, well say it's turn two, so there will be another character available. We got Gregson. When you're moving characters starting from turn two, they need to move from the car where they are, your action points need to move from the car where they are, and they need to go to cards that do not contain pieces of your own color. So for example, right now, if orange moves, uh, game orange could only use the help of Toby, Lestrade, or Gregson, because there are other there are other orange pieces in, in the way. Of course, there are ways of cycling that so that you show up 
uh, in places that your pawns just vacate it so you don't break the rules of not two pieces of the same color in the same area. There is another interesting thing, the three initial characters are always available, but the other characters that are added, starting from day one, uh, get tired easily. So if uh, during a turn both players have consulted the character, have used the help of that character, the card is placed face down and it is not available next turn. So that prevents you from going back and forth and creating always the same chains of action. You know, you see an optimal chain of action, everybody wants to exploit it, good, but they won't be able to exploit it every turn, only one turn, because then the characters will not be available. It's a simple, smart idea. So, uh, you're mainly, in general, you're collecting magnifying glasses as you need, using game effects to collect these cards here. Uh, that are color coded, number coded, and really the number is what matters the most because that is the number of victory points that a set is worth with some modifications. So you get cards using game effects and you put them in your play area, you refill the line um, when it's needed, and you're placing cards in your play area forming, forming sets. So I'm trying to show you how it would work. This is a special type of card. Well, it's kind of, it works like out of clues. You collect like a clues, but it's a map and it forms its own sets and it is scored differently from other cards. So for example, here I have these two cards, I put them together, I have these two cards, I'm forming a set, I'm forming another set, and so on and so forth. These cards here, this type of card here is a wild card, you can add it to an existing set or you can use it to start a new set. There are also game effects that allow you to keep your clues secret, so you keep them face down, and on top of the fact that the opponent doesn't know exactly how many clues you have a certain type, there's another advantage, that is the Face down hidden clues cannot be targeted by other game effects. For example, Irene Adler, she's an expert thief, and what she does is to st she steals cards from from the opponent. You need to pay her quite a bit, but it can be pretty powerful. So this is, in essence, the game. You move your action pawns on the board uh, and trying to exploit the capabilities of your associates uh, as best as you can. You collect magnifying glasses that you spend to purchase clues and use other game effects to get clues and at the end, at the end of turn 7, the players compare the sets that they have. The player that has the majority in each set scores the value of the set, that is the number on the card. So if I had the majority in the 8 category, I score 8 points. Minus, however, the number of cards of that type that the opponent has. So if I have 3, 8 and my opponent has 1, I score 7 points because I have the majority, so I score 8 points. I subtract the number of cards that my opponent has in that category, which is 1. 8 minus 1 is 7. Also, if you have all of the cards of a single category and the opponent has zero, you get a bonus. As for the maps, uh, they score in the way that you see here. If you have one, you get minus one, and then if you are two, three, four, or five, you score these values respected, respectively, up to ten points if you have five of these cards. What happens if you have zero? I guess nothing. It's not like there is a worse penalty than minus one, mm, I think. I guess the idea is that if you start collecting maps, you're taking a risk. I don't know why that would be risky, why it's better to have zero than one. But if you commit to build that set, you need to work on it. Otherwise, uh, it may turn into a penalty. So Holmes, Sherlock and Minecraft is not really a game about Sherlock Holmes and Minecraft Holmes. It remains pretty abstract in general. Stuff to say that the mystery is not a mystery, there is no solution whatsoever. Uh, it's not a game that is thematic like Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, which I reviewed uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it, it just has a completely different conception philosophy behind it. It is an abstract uh, Worker placement set collection game with a little bit of a Holmesian theme. But I have to say, this being said, if you do know the original stories, I think that there is some good work that has been done in mirroring some of the specific traits of the characters in the abilities of the 
of the people that you or the people or the animals uh, that you can use to perform actions and to collect clues. I mean, Adler that steals cards, Toby that is good at collecting cards, um, the journalist that can that is a little bit unpredictable, Carter but can give you some hidden information. There's really some, there are some nice details here um, that uh, fans of Holmes will enjoy. Again, still, this is not really a game about Holmes. This being said, it is a solid game. It is a really solid and fun, simple game. The entry point in terms of complexity is very, is very accessible. It's a very easy game to get into. Um, even more so, many of the games of this type, where at the beginning you had to explain a range of game effects of cryptic icons to the new player. Um, not the problem here, because at the beginning you only need to explain five icons, uh, the, work, the way five cards work, and then the other cards you explain as they emerge one at a time, one per turn, one per day. So it's very cool because the first game is a full game and also it is a tutorial. You can get started very easily. So it's very easy, it's very easy to uh, teach the game to new players even if they're not um, regular board gamers. So, and then the flow, the pace of the game is very neat, is very, is uh, it's a nice pace because you do not have many actions to choose from, to agonize about you only have three actions that you can take and those are also and the available options are limited by the present position of your pawns it's interesting to clear to create some cycles some sequences but also i think that the game has really smart uh, smart ways of preventing you from falling in love with a single strategy repeating that all the time that would make the game dull uh, the fact that you cannot count on the carters being there all the time also, the characters, some of the characters uh, will be more or less effective depending on when they come out. For example, Irene Adler is more expensive to use later in the game. And Billy, uh, another character, is much more powerful earlier in the game. So depending on when they come out, you may have a game that is highly interactive because you have Irene Adler at the beginning and players steal from each other all the time, or less interactive if she comes out later. And Billy, again, can have his effect altered by when it comes out. So more ways uh, to create variety in what is otherwise a very economic, very simple, very tight system. So I like it. I like it. I like the fact that it's simple, linear, but it has nice interesting decisions. There is the, the competition for, uh, for um, limited resources. There is something always fun, the scoring based on majority. So nothing is certain. It's about, I need to have more cards than you. And yet at the same time, sometimes those games Games can be very swingy because a single resource that you collect gets your majority and then you grab everything and so that can create a huge swing. Yeah, you do have an effect of that kind which is important because otherwise what's the point of collecting majority but it is mitigated somewhat by the fact that the cards that the opponent has collected are not thrown uh, down the drain, they still worth, uh, they're still worth and they still count against your total. So you get majority, you get more points, but the opponent has built towards a certain majority, even if your op opponent doesn't achieve it, that still counts, that still matters. So you do feel that every card that you collect uh, matters one way or the other, and I like that, I like that very much. It is a smart, simple, a worker placement game and um, and set collection uh, in a certain sense the the mechanics where you move around on these cards with these icons reminded me of harbor a small game by by tmg uh, i have saw some similarities but definitely the two games are very different from one another this one is fun, simple, linear, yes, uh, straightforward, yes, but not simplistic, not devoid of interesting decisions. I find it to be a fun, entertaining filler, perfect two-player game, perfect play with your spouse game, and for players so that also enjoy the original stories about Sherlock Holmes, you have to have, make a little bit of transition, you have to unlearn some things, meaning you have to learn not to demand absolute accuracy in the game, to enjoy the game for what it is, a fairly abstract game, but in that category of Euro-ish uh, abstract games, this is definitely a strong one.